Good afternoon. My name is Amanda Soa, and I am a student project manager at the Clark Firm for Contemporary Issues at Dickinson College. When we held the Clark Firm event in person, we took a moment to acknowledge that the land on which we are gathered on belonged to indigenous people prior to European settlement. Currently, I am inhabiting the ancestral land of the Lanai Lenape, the Susquehannock, the Conestoga, the Hadan Osani, the Shawnee, the Eri, and later the Indian children of the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. I encourage everyone watching this evening's program to take a moment after our presentation to acknowledge the tribes whose traditional land you currently inhabit. On behalf of Dickinson College and the Clark Firm, the Department of East Asian Studies and Anthropology, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event, Pandemic Preparedness and Environmental Awareness. The recent COVID-19 COVID pandemic has exposed how much information is unknown about zoonotic diseases, which the World Health Organization defines as any disease or infection transferable to humans from vertebrate animals. Their presence and prevalence motivate scientists to discover what their origins are, what influences their growth, and how human actions contribute to their presence. The National Center for Biotechn Biotechnological Information has traced some of these influences to the increase of technology, commerce, industry, international travel, agriculture, and land use. While these changes have led to an increased standard of living, they have also led to the destruction of ecosystems and contributed to climate change. But perhaps just as humans are contributing to the creation of zoonotic diseases like COVID-19, the changes that are occurring could help manage and prevent zoonotic diseases. As a college student, the effect of the pandemic is an experience that has left a very profound impact on me. The Zoom fatigue, no pun intended, the social isolation of being away from loved ones and the loss of a real college experience are just examples of how COVID-19 has disrupted my life. Additionally, the protests and discussions against social inequality have made this time precarious, causing us to reflect on our beliefs, actions, and societal structures. I remain hopeful about the future and keep the faith that there is a light at the end of this very dark tunnel. Our speaker this evening, Frederick Keck, worked towards this future as he discusses how to improve preparedness and use environmental knowledge and awareness for better protection for the upcoming years. Frederick Keck is a social anthropologist and a director of research at the Laboratory of Social Anthropology at the College de France. He has been researching the history of social anthropology and contemporary biopolitical questions raised by avian influenza. He published Claude Levi Strauss in Introduction, Lucien Levy Bru and Philosophy et Anthropologie en Mode Grippe, and Avian Reservoirs, Virus Hunters and Bird Watchers in Chinese Sentinel Posts. He has co edited Des Hommes Malades des Animaux, Len, in 2012, and Sentinel Devices in 2013. In 2012, he also received the Bronze Medal from the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique and is a fellow of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. There will be a question and answer session following the presentation, so please type your questions into the live chat next to this YouTube video at any time. We now welcome Frederick Keck to begin his presentation. Thank you very much. Um, good evening to everyone or good morning, depending on the place where you are. Um, the whole world looks at Pennsylvania today uh, as we count the votes for the presidential election. So I'm very happy to be uh, among you today. Uh, so I will now share my screen. Um,
Can you see? No. Yes, we can see. Can, can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, yes. Um, but just one thing, just make sure that it's in um, presentation mode. Yes. So the Thank topic you. of my talk will be pandemic preparedness and environmental awareness. And um, as um, the presenter just mentioned, I've published a book um, on the, the collaboration between virologists and uh, ornithologists or between virus hunters and bird watchers in China, uh, based on the research I have led in the last 20, uh, 15 years. And this has led me to present some reflections on the connections between virology and ecology, uh, particularly as regards South China. Uh, but the reason why this connection between virology and ecology has been made is that um, for the last 40 years, uh, uh, emerging viruses have revealed uh, the changing relations between humans and animals as um, global health authorities have become aware of the uh, risk of zoonotic viruses, that is viruses that cross species borders and are transmitted between, from, from animals to humans or from non-human animals to human animals, as you might prefer. Um, and this, um, it is considered that 75% uh, uh, of um, uh, emerging viruses are zoonotic viruses, uh, others are uh, uh, viruses coming from multi-drug resistance. Uh, so because of the uh, uh, accelerating um, uh, ecological changes uh, regarding livestock or wild animals, uh, these uh, new viruses have, have multiplied in the last 50 years. Uh, we, we might think that they, they, they were mutations among animals that successfully spread to humans before, uh, but uh, the uh, amplification of these viruses, uh, particularly by the, the livestock industry and by um, wildlife traffic have uh, led to this uh, warning by uh, global health authorities. This warning started with uh, the emergence of Ebola in Central Africa in 1976, uh, a very pathogenic virus killing 90% of the people uh, it infects, uh, it emerged in Central Africa and it was later uh, discovered that it, it spreads uh, through primates uh, and uh, probably comes from, from bats. Um, and the emergence of Ebola contradicted the uh, declaration by WHO of the eradication of smallpox in 1980, because smallpox as a scourge that affected um, uh, European populations uh, in the, the, the last two centuries and particularly destroying Amerindian uh, uh, populations uh, when um, Europeans brought it uh, in the 16th, uh, 17th century. Smallpox has no animal reservoir, so it was possible to eradicate smallpox uh, by vaccination. So at the time when WHO declared uh, the end of infectious disease and the possibility to dedicate more funding to uh, chronic diseases. Ebola emerged as the sign that new uh, infectious diseases would um, uh, appear uh, due to the uh, changing relations between humans and animals. And this uh, prediction was um, uh, confirmed by the emergence of HIV AIDS in the, in the US. In, uh, identified in uh, 1983. It was uh, later showed that uh, HIV AIDS uh, probably mutated from um, uh, primates to humans in uh, Central Africa in the 1920s and was then um, uh, transmitted through uh, um, uh, traffic of uh, humans um, from uh, Africa to America in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, so, and after uh, the HIV pandemic, which was also a contradiction of the declaration of WHO, uh, the, 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 the main target was to um, uh, uh, anticipate the next pandemic at the animal reservoir by, by, by stopping uh, 
uh, emerging viruses uh, among, among animals. And that was the reason for uh, the um, mobilization on um, the H5N1 avian flu virus in uh, emerging in Hong Kong in 1997. Uh, uh, H5N1 was not a very lethal virus. Um, mm -hmm. it, um, uh, it, it, it killed, I mean, it was lethal, but it was not very contagious. It killed um, two persons out of three it infected and it infected uh, 12 persons in, in Hong Kong in uh, 1997. But it, it um, but there was the there was a fear that it would um, uh, successfully spread spread between humans, and then um, uh, that's the reason why the Hong Kong authorities killed all the birds uh, living in Hong Kong uh, to eradicate the reservoir of uh, uh, of this new flu virus. It was quite successful, but after that, the H five N one virus uh, spread. Um, uh, across uh, birds uh, in uh, Asia, Europe, and Africa, and these measures of uh, eradication were replicated in different uh, locations where this virus uh, emerged. And the, the, the global warning on uh, H5N1 as um, animal disease that could transform into a human disease uh, was confirmed by the emergence of SARS-CoV in uh, 2003. Uh, a virus that um, killed um, 800 people after infecting 8,000, so a 10% lethality rate, and uh, which uh, was transmitted from bats to humans by the uh, intermediary vehicle uh, of um, uh, animals um, uh, sold on the uh, Chinese traditional uh, market uh, uh, called uh, mass civet. Um, and, and uh, SARS-CoV was um, uh, the first uh, successful uh, uh, global alert on an emerging uh, virus. Uh, the, 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 it was the first time that a coronavirus spread from uh, animals to humans. So the, 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 the consequences of the virus uh, were uh, not known and there was no vaccine. And um, so in the same way as, as uh, emerging uh, flu viruses among uh, birds, um, uh, lead to uh, a, a lack of vaccine, uh, the SARS-CoV uh, emerged in the world where, where no uh, vaccine for coronavirus um, uh, were available. Um, and, and this, and fortunately or unfortunately for us uh, today, uh, the SARS virus returned to its uh, animal reservoir, so it circulated among bats. And so there was no need to, to build a vaccine for SARS. Um, in 2009, uh, there was a new uh, uh, virus coming from um, uh, from pigs, an uh, H1N1 uh, swine flu virus um, uh, that emerged in, in Mexican farms. It was actually at the border between the US and Mexico. Um, and this uh, H1N1 virus was less lethal than expected, but it was very contagious. Uh, and as you can see on this uh, uh, diagram, uh, uh, flu virus uh, mutate among uh, birds and then are transmitted uh, through pigs uh, to humans. And sometimes they transmit directly from birds to humans and then they are much more lethal. Uh, so pigs uh, work as an uh, uh, attenuator, a mediator between uh, birds and, and humans. Uh, in 2018, a new Ebola virus uh, emerged in, in West Africa and it was uh, dreadful because um, um, uh, there are big cities in West Africa and, and uh, uh, but fortunately these big cities have been preserved so it was only spread in in, in, in a small part of West Africa uh, but still uh, very costly in terms of, of human lives and also uh, health uh, infrastructures uh, and and it was expected that this virus, uh, was transmitted from Central Africa to West Africa by bats, but it has not been uh, proven. And then in 2020, um, this new uh, uh, SARS-CoV emerged from Central China in Wuhan. Um, uh, the, the, the similarities between this new virus and a bat virus were, were shown, uh, but the uh, animal uh, mediation, uh, the animal vehicle, uh, is still lacking. So there were stories about pangolins, but it, it, the, the similarities are not strong enough. Uh, but as you can see, the, the two main reservoirs for uh, emerging viruses are bats and, and birds. And it's, it's, 
no uh, surprise that they are uh, flying animals um, uh, and a certain image of, of wilderness um, because they can um, cohabit with different species uh, and sharing viruses between these species. But then when these um, uh, living animals uh, 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 move closer to human habitats, uh, either by deforestation for bats or by uh, livestock, in livestock industry for, for birds, uh, then uh, these mutations that uh, constantly um, uh, emerge uh, among these, these uh, uh, wild animals are transmitted to humans and then those pandemics. So my research as an anthropologist was to understand what kinds of um, uh, rationality was used to uh, uh, mitigate the risk of these emerging viruses. And um, with um, uh, some colleagues um, uh, working in, in the US, uh, we, we have been become interested by the fact that it was not a, a rationality of risk uh, on the model of prevention, which was applied to uh, uh, earlier uh, epidemics such as tuberculosis or, or smallpox uh, based on the epidemiology of cases, uh, which uh, allowed uh, um, uh, scientists and public health administration to, to predict uh, the, uh, the, 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 the future of, of, of an epidemic. But it was rather a, a, a rationality of preparedness, which rather came from a military, um, um, military uh, domains uh, particularly the pre preparing for a nuclear attack or preparing for a terrorist, terrorist attack. Uh, and and the, the rationality of preparedness is that you have to be prepared for uh, an event whose probability cannot be calculated, but uh, whose um, consequences are uh, catastrophic. So you have to imagine that the catastrophe is realized to, to, to mitigate its, its consequences. And so this, this rationality of preparedness comes a lot from uh, what you might call survivalist uh, uh, backgrounds. It's the idea that you can survive uh, through a, a disaster uh, by, by being prepared. And so being prepared is opposed to being scared. Uh, if, if you imagine that the disaster is here, then uh, you, you will not uh, panic, uh, but you will mobilize uh, your competencies uh, and so it's a state of, of permanent vigilance uh, that uh, must be uh, taught, uh, not only to adults, but also to kids, as you see from this book uh, that is famous for being uh, recommended by Bill Gates, who uh, is uh, famous for uh, investing in uh, uh, global health and, and preparing for uh, pandemic viruses. And this is, so this is the book that uh, we have uh, published with uh, my co uh, that, that my co colleague Andy Lakoff has published to show that uh, um, global health is, is real, has been reorganized around this rationality of preparedness um, uh, 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 with, with the constant failure. Uh, prepare, preparedness is always criticized for either doing too much or, I, I, uh, or uh, doing not enough. Uh, so, so it's the question of emergency. Excuse me. Rafael, je Excuse me. Um, so, so the question I have raised is, is, is the, the connection between uh, pandemic pre preparedness and environmental awareness, given that uh, uh, preparedness has been applied to uh, uh, ecological milieu in which uh, uh, viruses emerge. So um, uh, uh, I have um, connected uh, pandemic techniques of preparedness uh, with uh, transformations of relations between humans and, and, and animals. Uh, and I have looked at uh, uh, how uh, in these different uh, settings where humans prepare for pandemic, um, uh, their relations with animals are transformed in a way that uh, makes them aware of, um, uh, um, of their impact on, on, on animals. Uh, and so the first technique of preparedness, and there will be three, and that, that's the, the three techniques of preparedness I will distinguish. First technique of preparedness is, is sentinels, that is the, the use of animals as uh, early warning signals. Um, um, and uh, a sentinel is a term that is applied to, to, to soldiers, of course, um, when, when they are on the front line uh, uh, in a battle and they, they have to carry uh, um, uh, signals uh, of 
the, the, the presence of the enemy, they have to, to carry that back uh, to those who are uh, in, 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 in the real line. Um, but, but it's also applied to, to chickens in poultry farms, uh, unvaccinated chickens um, who uh, die first or only catch, uh, uh, show signals uh, of the virus in, in a farm where, when it is infected by, by a flu virus. And the, the Chinese term for these uh, sentinel birds who are at, at, the, at the, the beginning of the row of cages is uh, uh, Bingji. Uh, so um, uh, chickens who whistle like soldiers. And so I'm, I, I was particularly interested by uh, this connection, this alliance between uh, humans and, and chickens uh, as uh, uh, they mobilize in the fight against pandemic viruses. Um, other measures of Sentinel is um, the surveillance uh, of uh, um, poultry markets. And as you can see, uh, Chinese um, veterinarians are collecting uh, viruses on uh, geese and ducks and quails. Um, and then they uh, store these uh, viruses uh, to uh, see the mutations of uh, uh, flu viruses and, 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 and to uh, track potentially pandemic viruses. And this is also the rationality that has been applied to bad viruses. Um, uh, after SARS, uh, bats have been uh, um, uh, st studied uh, and uh, collected uh, and sampled um, uh, by virologists who go in caves um, to um, take uh, samples of their feces or of their blood. Uh, and this is a picture of Shou Zheng Li, who is a Chinese virologist working in Wuhan and who uh, has, has gone in the caves of uh, Yunnan uh, to, um, um, to, to take samples from, from bats. And uh, as you can see, she's uh, releasing a, a bat. So uh, the question of the protection of, uh, of bats uh, after being released is, is a major ethical issue for uh, virologists. They, they, because bats are often uh, protected species, they cannot be released, um, sorry, they cannot be killed uh, to um, uh, take samples, so they have to be released. Uh, and and, um, and I, I was very uh, interested in the, uh, also in the debate about uh, uh, bird flu uh, on, on how to properly release a bird uh, in a context where they might carry viruses. Um, so, so all the debates that, that humans have had about the signals that birds uh, uh, signs uh, send to humans when they, uh, when they fly in the sky uh, have been recast uh, by debates on how to properly release birds or bats um, in, a, in a context where they, they might carry viruses. And, and so the question of release is a major question for uh, con people who conserve nature and protect wildlife. Uh, today. And th so the concept of sentinels is interesting to follow the transformations of uh, uh, relations between humans and birds or bats. Uh, and it must be distinguished from uh, the concept of whistleblower. Uh, a whistleblower is an individual who, who raises an alert in a, in a public space. And, um, uh, and where, whereas the sentinel is, is a, a non-human that uh, sends a signal on, on the border between species. These are two quite different uh, ways to uh, raise awareness. Uh, whistleblowers ha have to um, uh, speak loud in a public space. And if they cannot speak loud enough, uh, then uh, they, they, in some way, they have to sacrifice. That's the lesson that um, we have learned from Li Wenliang, who is this uh, young uh, physician, ophthalmologist, who who died uh, in February from COVID-19 after being blamed by uh, Chinese authorities, uh, the local authorities of Wuhan for uh, spreading bad uh, news in the, uh, in, in the uh, social network. Um, and, and this uh, figure of the whistleblower can be compared to a, a, a figure that we, we had in, in France and that you may have heard of um, because it is, is famous for uh, raising very early um, uh, the issue of chloroquine. Chloroquine is uh, this uh, 
drug that has been used against uh, malaria and that uh, um, seem to be uh, working against COVID-19, uh, the early stages of, of the uh, viral uh, replication. Um, and, um, and because, uh, so this, uh, this uh, virologist, uh, Didier Raoult, uh, was even quoted by uh, President uh, Trump uh, for showing that chloroquine was a, a good uh, uh, drug um, to control COVID-19 at the, at the early stage uh, of, the, of the disease. Uh, it was later contradicted by clinical uh, trials that, that showed um, that it was not efficacious. Uh, but, but he was considered uh, in France as, as a saint or as a, as a hero, as, as and you can see, he was from Marseille. So Marseille is a place where you, you do a lot of um, this kind of, of uh, candles uh, for saints, uh, Saint Raoult. Uh, so so the, the, this way to um, uh, consider uh, whistleblowers or, or, or th those who carry bad news or, or good news at, at the early stages of a pandemic is also a way to sacralize them uh, for, for, for better or worse. Um, and, and this is something that cannot happen with, with animals. Uh, th there are some sacrifices of animals when they are killed to be eradicated, but sentinel, um, uh, the, the use of sentinel is, is quite a different thing. It's, it's a way to precisely invent relations between humans and animals uh, at, 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 the, at, at the level of, of, the, of the vulnerabilities they share in, in common. Uh, so without using concept of, of the sacred. And, and uh, a, a third figure of, of the sentinel uh, is, is the weak signal. So uh, we have discovered uh, that uh, it was possible to identify uh, signs of the virus uh, uh, before they are symptomatic uh, by using dogs. Uh, so dogs have been trained to uh, smell the, the, the the, the smell uh, of uh, uh, to smell to smell the, the virus uh, on on patients uh, uh, and so policemen were, were used to um, to train these dogs and uh, the also uh, administration of the um, uh, of the used water uh, have been trained to um, collect uh, uh, samples from the uh, used water and and see if there was uh, traces of uh, the virus. Uh, in, 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 in cities, so if, if there were traces, it was a sign that the, the virus was circulating at a weak, uh, at, at a low level. Uh, so, so the uh, sentinels are also a way to capture weak signals uh, before uh, uh, the, the, the epidemic raise, uh, goes to levels of sacred uh, sacrifice or sacredness. Um, and that's one of the, of the, of the environmental lessons of of sentinels, uh, which you can also find, uh, for example, in the controversy about uh, endocrine disruptors, is that you can you can read weak signals in the bodies of animals because they are more sensitive to these uh, weak signals. Now, the second uh, technique of preparedness that I have studied is uh, uh, simulations. Simulations are based on scenarios uh, uh, of disaster, and and they. Um, implement this scenario uh, in, in, in daily life. So they, they, they try to show that the, the big uh, discontinuities of the future are already there in the small continuities of the, of the present. Uh, and this is, a, this is a map of the mutations of um, the, the, the coronavirus. Uh, it, it, it has not mutated a lot, um, um, but um, the, the idea is that um, uh, if you fo follow the, the continuities of mutations, then you might you might see a, a discontinuity that that would be catastrophic because then you, you would not be able to predict uh, the lethality of the, of the virus, whereas the, the virus has been quite um, stable in its lethality uh, as for now. So uh, a lot of the uh, simulations I have observed are made on these um, um, computer uh, softwares. Uh, using uh, genetic sequences to build uh, phylogenetic trees. Uh, so it's a way to uh, inscribe uh, the, 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 the newness of the pandemic in uh, the, the knowledge that is already uh, circulating. Uh, and so that's what is called desktop simulations. But th there's also um, uh, another kind of simulations, which is called real ground simulations, where actors are asked 
to um, um, simulate a, a pandemic in a, in a hospital and uh, to uh, uh, play uh, as if they were sick uh, so that the hospital staff uh, would uh, treat them and also be able to make a triage before between uh, those who, who are actually uh, infected by the pandemic and, and those who only have the, the symptoms. Um, uh, so as you see, this is a, an exercise that has been uh, organized in Hong Kong where I could take part as, a, as an observer uh, and it's called Redwood um, and all the exercises I've, uh, in Hong Kong uh, bear the names of, um, of, of natural beings uh, such as oak, uh, uh, or eagle, um, as, it, as if to show that the that, uh, pandemic science crime in nature was uh, uh, the exercises that have been organized in, in China, for example, bear the name of uh, like Great Wall to show that it's, they, they are ways to show uh, uh, human strengths against uh, uh, a natural enemy. Uh, so exercises have become really a part of the life uh, of uh, uh, Hong Kong society, uh, 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 they were exercise, they were organized twice a year, uh, and and when when real pandemic emerged, uh, such as H one N one, they were also considered as an exercise. So the distinction between uh, um, exercise and reality, or between fiction and reality, has been blurred by the the the, the, the constant repetition of these uh, exercises. Um, and so, and so the actors who were involved were also um, uh, working in associations for the management of small accidents. So they, they, were, they were shifting uh, to, to a, a higher level of mobilization in these exercises, but they were also involved in, in, in regular management of, of uh, accidents and disasters. Now, the, the third um, technique of preparedness that I've studied is uh, a stockpiling. Uh, and this is really uh, uh, um, uh, a technique of preparedness that concerns the pharmaceutical industry and uh, particularly as uh, regards uh, influenza uh, viruses, uh, the, the involvement of uh, pharmaceutical industries to uh, build uh, vaccines that could target uh, um, specific uh, flu viruses. And after 1978, uh, eight, when there was a a uh, massive campaign to vaccinate uh, swine flu virus, uh, the, the US uh, authorities started to uh, stockpile uh, vaccines for the next uh, pandemic. Um, and, and these measures have been then uh, um, raised at the international level uh, as models to prepare for uh, a future pandemics. So there was a kind of competition between um, uh, uh, nation states and particularly in Europe, uh, between Europe and the United States on, on uh, the management of stockpiles. So uh, having a stockpile of, uh, virus, of, of uh, vaccines and antivirals and masks was, was a measure of the development of, uh, uh, of, of, of a nation state. Uh, and uh, what we have seen um, with this current pandemic is that uh, uh, stockpiling uh, fails um, because it is in contradiction uh, with uh, the, the other uh, um, norm of uh, neoliberal societies, which is the necessity to um, reduce cost and uh, adjust uh, uh, the uh, economy to uh, fluxes. Uh, and so um, in France, uh, the stockpile of uh, mass, for example, have not been uh, uh, re recycled. Uh, have not been um, uh, uh, renovated. Uh, uh, and so we had to face um, uh, 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 a deprivation uh, of masks um, at, at the beginning of this uh, pandemic, a, a huge lack of masks. And, and uh, the public health authorities relied on import from China uh, to um, send masks to uh, public health uh, uh, staff. So stockpiling is an interesting way to um, uh, uh, build order uh, among uh, goods uh, because it, it prioritizes uh, goods. 
for example, it, it, it prioritizes goods in a situation of scarce resources. Um, so, for example, um, masks should be distributed to uh, public health uh, staff before being uh, sent to uh, uh, teachers or to ordinary citizens. Um, and uh, the same for vaccines that should be uh, given to um, uh, nurses and, and also um, government, uh, uh, government staff. Um, and stockpiling uh, as, as a way to prioritize goods can be uh, contrasted to storage, which is also a way to accumulate goods, uh, but in a way that it, they are available for uh, everyone. And a lot of the biologists I talked uh, with uh, said that they uh, made the contrast between uh, stockpiling vaccines, uh, which was uh, something uh, um, that states did in discussion with pharmaceutical industries, and storing viruses. So they, they were storing viruses in fridges, but also in computers, in, in data banks, such as gen banks, um, in such a way that uh, a, an emerging virus would find its place among this uh, huge quantity of viral information uh, and, and the storage. So the, 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 the problem of storage is, is an interesting one. If you think in the long-term um, uh, dimension, uh, of course, it, it, it is a, a technological problem for uh, all the um, data banks that, that are now uh, highly secured, uh, particularly protected against uh, any kind of uh, disaster such as um, uh, an electromagnetic wave, uh, but, but uh, human societies have always stored goods uh, in such a way uh, as to um, uh, anticipate uh, um, future uh, scarcities. Uh, and this is something that uh, Claude Lévy-Strauss has particularly studied under the, the name of um, uh, bricolage. Bricolage is a way to store goods uh, to um, cope with any kind of uh, uncertainty. And, and storage as something that uh, societies have always done uh, can also be contrasted with uh, what I would call pathological uh, storage or hoarding. And this is a, a, a term that doesn't exist in French. And so I find it very interesting in, in English because hoarding is the, uh, is the pathological accumulation of goods uh, precisely to uh, uh, anticipate future disasters. Uh, uh, archaeologists are talking about hoarding when uh, 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 some uh, um, uh, sacred materials are found uh, in, uh, in, 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 in fields uh, of uh, excavation. Um, but we have seen uh, uh, at the beginning of this pandemic uh, individuals who, who started uh, buying uh, a lot of goods in order to uh, protect themselves against the consequences of the pandemic. And now we uh, see um, an accumulation of masks uh, as uh, we uh, use masks uh, as, a, as a technique to protect ourselves. And, and, and now, as you, you see, we can imagine that uh, archaeologists of the future will find uh, a, a layer of, of masks in the geological um, uh, archives uh, as, as, a, as a trace of, of the current pandemic. So we also have to be aware of the, of the cost uh, of our forms of... Uh, uh, stockpiling, um, uh, storage, and, and hoarding uh, as, uh, as we accumulate goods to protect ourselves from this pandemic. Um, I, know, uh, I have two more slides uh, and then I will conclude. Um, the, this pandemic uh, teaches us that we have to live with, with uncertainty. Uh, uh, what virologists have taught me is that um, when, when new viruses come from uh, animals, such as uh, bats or, or birds, they are not recognized by uh, the uh, immune system. And the immune system is composed of cells uh, that try to uh, capture the information um, from, from uh, 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 microbes and then transmit this information to other cells who will try to integrate the information in the body. And, and these cells are called um, sentinel cells or, or dendritic cells. Uh, and when these uh, dendritic cells are bypassed by um, uh, viruses, uh, then the, the, the immune system overreacts and this is called a cytokine storm. Uh, and the, the, the overreaction of the immune system is very difficult to predict um, when, when a patient enters uh, the hospitals. 
So, so it's it's one of the lessons I've I've learned that uh, when early warning signals of of, a, of an emerging virus are not sent, then the re reaction of the of the immune system is very unpredictable. Uh, but when we capture this the uncertainty of, of new viruses early enough and and we learn from them, uh, then we can live with viruses. And this is my uh, final slides. Um, yeah. Uh, that, that we have to cultivate our relationships with, with microbes um, um, in such a way that we, we can live with uh, foreign microbes uh, with information we, we don't know. Uh, but we, we can also live with all the microbes that, that live around us and within us. Uh, and this is one of the uh, uh, lessons I've learned from microbiologists who, who work on the microbiome, so all the uh, um, microbes uh, living in our gut or in our skin and and that we capture when we cultivate when we garden when we eat and and this has also been one of the lessons of this pandemic uh, one of the environmental lessons of this pandemic that um, uh, uh, a lot of people have rediscovered gardening or, or cooking as a way to cultivate another relation uh, to to microbes so so if, if the, the, the lessons of biology is, is that uh, we have to live with, with changing environments, then it's also that we, we have to uh, reconnect to the microbes in uh, the ecosystems in which we, uh, uh, we have co-evolved. Um, thank you for attention and, and looking forward to your uh, questions. And I have to... I have to plug my computer, sorry. Um, thank you so much, um, Mr. Keck, for a lovely presentation. It was very insightful. Um, I have a, uh, there's a question, um, is that, which goes back to your idea of using sentinels as kind of giving off signals to let us know, to let us know more about, to let us know more about these kinds of diseases. And my question is that sometimes, is there a way that these sentinels can be, and the signals that they give off, can they be misread um, in terms of what they're giving off, in terms of, um, in, in relation to diseases and to, in relation to um, pandemic diseases? Is there a way that they could be misread and give off wrong information or for a scientist to kind of read read it wrongly and kind of give off false information and have more dire consequences later on? Um, sorry, I had some technical problems to hear the question. Can you, can you make it again? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I was asking in, in the beginning, you talked about how you, animals, animals could be used as sentinels to give off signals. Mm like viruses and stuff like that. And I was wondering if there was a way for these animals to, no, for scientists to kind of misread the signals that these animals may be giving off. Mm. Because it seems mm. there seems to be a relationship between- Sure, and yeah. And um, the kind of signals. Yeah, yes. yeah, that's a very good question. Um, uh, so, so the virologists I've worked with uh, try to capture the, the early signals of, of a pandemic and that, that's a way to um, raise a good alert, but they, they're always um, um, aware of the possibility of, of sending a false alert or, or capturing the, uh, a false signal. Um, and, and this is something that they reflect by talking about these uh, cells that are lured uh, by, by, by the pathogens. If, if, they, if they miss the pathogen, if they, um, if, if they send the wrong signal, then the the whole system might uh, be disrupted by a cas cascade of, of signals. That is uh, precisely what, what we see with, with fake news is that uh, th there's a, a small modification of the information about the um, uh, pandemic. And, and then uh, there's a, a spread of rumors and, um, and, and, um, and wrong information uh, that, that can lead to the disruption of societies. So, so yeah, scientists are very aware of this possibility that um, a, a false signal might uh, trigger uh, a, a bad science and, and, and dangerous political behaviors.
can't hear you. Uh -huh, sorry. <laughs> so, I um, mean, speaking of um, bad signs, I was just thinking of the differentiation that you made between whistleblowers and sentinels, whereas you kind of gave sentinels, you gave the characterization of sentinels, animals, and then whistleblowers to kind of uh, people in terms of like the chloroquine as a means to cure COVID and whatnot. Um, my thing, my question, my next question to you is that when, when like disaster strikes and we have these kind of mass health scares, there's always a whole bunch of information that are being thrown out there. And there's a whole bunch of first inquiry and first thoughts and first stuff like that. And I think that sometimes part, because of that, people are fearful are fearful of what to think of scientists or they all think that it's not going to work mm. what they're doing and stuff like that. Yeah. It kind of enhances this fear of believing in what scientists say. And so as a scientist and as a study of this particular field, mm. how would you react to that? And how would you respond to that? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very good remark. Um, so when the pandemic sp starts, it, it's like um, it's like a, a myth. It's like a, a new story of origin. So uh, the, the the pandemic is is marking a, a series of events in which uh, scientists um, play the role of heroes, where they say, uh, "I'm the first to talk about chloroquine," and and in fact, uh, Raoult was working with chloroquine particularly in Africa for the last uh, 20 years. So, so a crisis is an opportunity for scientists to act uh, precisely as inventors. And, uh, and so the role of um, uh, social scientists is to de deconstruct uh, this uh, pretension of scientists to be the first. Um, but it, it's, it's also, uh, my, my role as an anthropologist is also uh, to, to show the ordinary work of, of scientists when they collect samples um, and, and they build these relations with, with animals uh, in, in the sense that um, it's, it's, another, it's another conception of, of mythology, uh, not in the sense of a, a narrative of origin, but rather as a as an, uh, 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 history like those told in Amazonia where humans and, and animals um, uh, live together and then there was a rupture uh, and so these these virologists tell us a story about this kind of uh, common origin with uh, with animals. Um, so 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 it, so my my work as an anthropologist is in some way to um, to 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 deconstruct the this heroic view of uh, of scientists, but in, in another way to to castigate to cast them as 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 hunters to 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 uh, describe them in a in a long term tem tempora in a long temporality of of uh, hunting hunting societies. And to our next question, we got a question in the chat, which is asking that you mentioned briefly that zoonotic diseases and wild and the wildlife trade. Could you kind of elaborate on what could be done in the future to limit the spread of viruses through things like that? Mm. What could be done to limit the spread of zoonotic viruses? Um, um, so the, the well, the uh, awareness of uh, zoonotic viruses started in the 1960s. Uh, there was the idea that um, um, ecosystem were disrupted, um, and viruses uh, showed uh, this disruption. So there was the idea that. Hi all, so it seems as if Mr. Keck is having some um, technical difficulties. Just give us a few minutes and he'll be back with us with your question. So just give us a few minutes. Thank you so much for being patient. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm back. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Do you want me to repeat the question or are you all good? No, no, um, I, I, got, I got a question on, uh, on the, how to limit the spread of zoonosis. So, so you, you, might, you might want to return to stable ecosystems, um, but, but uh, the idea that ecosystems are stable ha have, uh, has been very much criticized, um, and uh, particularly because it would lead to 
uh, restoring stable ecosystems by biosecurity and, and, and closing borders. Um, so, so I guess the, the, the other way to limit zoonosis is um, to um, uh, have a different relations to, to uh, microbes by precisely cultivating good microbes and, be, and, being, uh, and being more uh, uh, curious in some way and, and more cautious with emerging viruses. So, so precisely the idea uh, to um, uh, capture the information of, of emerging viruses at the early stages. So, so there's a possibility to continue living with a, a globalized economy by cultivating early warning uh, signals of, of uh, pathogens. Um, thank you so much for that answer. And I think my next question is more of a, um, it's a more of a personal question to you as an anthropologist who studies biology is, why did you get into this field and what kind of what sparked it for you to be mm. study these viruses and to um, research in it? Yeah, yeah, I started this research because I was intrigued by the massive killing of cows uh, in the 1990s uh, in the uh, crisis of uh, Matco disease. Uh, and uh, uh, so there was this uh, debate about uh, food safety and uh, uh, the attempt to regulate the food chain uh, by the calculation of risk. And, and then uh, I, I saw avian flu coming from Asia and uh, I thought that maybe uh, Asia had a different way to um, uh, manage uh, these uh, uh, animal diseases. So I, I, I was curious about how um, we, could, we could build different relations with animals than only killing them when they were um, considered as, as um, dangerous commodities. That was the beginning of my research. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And I know that was my last question, but my, this is just to wrap it up. I know you meant this connection between us using animals uh, as signals rather than just killing them off and discarding mm -hmm. them no longer available. Do you think would in the future we'll get to a point where, uh, and right now scientists are the ones that are reading off the signals from these sentinels, but do you think mm -hmm. we'll get to a future where farmers and other local people that work with animals could also be able to read off these signals as well? Yeah, definitely, yeah. So farmers uh, can develop relations with their animals by the use of technologies. Um, so so it, 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 it should also lead to reducing the number of animals they raise, but so technology is not bad in itself. Uh, uh, farmers are looking for other ways to interact with their, uh, with their animals, but, but um, they have integrated surveillance as, as, as a mode of daily relation with animals. And yeah, definitely virologists should uh, work with uh, farmers on how to perceive their animals in daily life. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Keck. This was really a wonderful presentation. We enjoyed it and I think I learned a lot and I think our audience learned a lot as well. So, uh, well, it's like afternoon here in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. So good afternoon to you. And what time is it there in France? Uh, it's 7 p.m. Yeah, so it's good evening to you and it's dinner time. So much <laughs> and have a wonderful night. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.